Dr. Lanzarek, when you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. All right. Don't drug grandma. Treating pain and agitation and dementia without sedation. As a hospice medical director, I've visited many elders in need of relief of pain, aggression, and fear. Entering one nursing home, I was struck. No one walked or talked. All the heads were dropped, dozing in wheelchairs. At lunch, all the plates had three mounds of glops, brown glops, green glops, and white glops. Is this right? Should our elders be tranquilized? Does treating anxiety and agitation have to be this way? Bodies slumped in wheelchairs, baby food for lunch? Many criticize the use of psych meds for elders. Don't drug grandma is their battle cry, and yes, it's a disgrace to just sedate elders so they're easier to manage. Those skeptical of medications for behavioral symptoms say that problem behaviors always stem from unmet needs. And we know that music, caring for needs, organizing enjoyable activities, really person-centered care, and spending time with elders can go a long way toward making them happy and healthy. Yet, is all well if we just stop medications? Critics primarily push to stop antipsychotics and narcotics, often suggesting that the use of these drugs in elders is always bad care. But the issue is so much more complex. Not all narcotics are bad. Not all over-the-counter medications or tranquilizers are good. The geriatric principles are one, get rid of the wrong medications. Two, treat pain. Three, always use person-centered care. And four, sometimes the right psych meds can um, uh, save lives and restore joy. The meds matter. One night, Ellen woke up sensing something wasn't right. She found her 84-year-old husband, Bruce, in the garage with the car running, trying to end his life. Soon after, he tried to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge, but at the last flash of clarity, he called the police. They took him to the emergency room. Ellen, his wife, thought that he'd be admitted to the psych unit, but without talking to her, they sent him to a hospital 50 miles away. There, he was treated for weeks with increasing doses of psych meds and then institutionalized closer to her. He was there for hours, his wife said. He was gone. By then, Ellen was desperate. She sought outside help and found a geriatrician or a specialist for elders. He couldn't walk, he couldn't talk, he looked vacant and he didn't interact. Ellen was skeptical that anything would be different this time. She'd seen so many doctors, tried so many changes. She challenged, she asked. Is this right? Does it have to be this way? The new doctor followed her lead and challenged every medication and assumption. They started by tapering off Ativan, an anxiety pill, mainly a sedative with uh, side effects that include paranoia, impulsiveness, impaired memory, judgment, and behavior. It's strong stuff. Over weeks, other problematic medications were adjusted. He ate better, started to walk, and went home. Several months later, he was more himself. That wry humor and quiet chuckle were back. Soon he was serving Christmas mass as a deacon again. As Bruce shared, it's just wonderful to be here. Tranquilizers are prescribed to one in 20 or over 16 million Americans and completely accepted by the medical orthodoxy. Nearly a third of elders taking Ativan or other sedatives have long-term prescriptions, mostly given by primary doctors, not geriatric specialists. Elders and women are three times more likely to get tranquilizer prescriptions, especially to treat poor sleep or anxiety. Yet tranquilizers are far from risk-free. Ativan, Xanax, Clonopin, or Ambien for use in anxiety or sleep medication. A minute, sorry. Increase the risk of falls and fractures, cause addiction, increase confusion and aggression. All these risks are greater for older people. As we saw with Bruce, Ativan itself can cause memory problems. An elder taking Ativan can, or other psychoactive medications can look demented, act demented. Even doctors can mistake side effects of the medication for being demented, as we saw with Bruce. The most insidious part is that once anxiety pills are started, it's difficult to stop. Xanax is the crack of the suburbs. Its withdrawal symptoms are similar to alcohol withdrawal, flaring psychosis, poor sleep, irritability, and confusion. 
too often these side effects of withdrawal are labeled as worsening dementia. It's not just tranquilizers. Numerous medications can lead to confusion, agitation, and just look like dementia. Don't accept all medications ordered. The next time you walk into a care facility and find your grandfather, your mother, or your spouse slumped over a lunch plate or agitated and fidgety, challenge that. Ask, is this right? Ask, does it have to be this way? Ask about the meds. Investigate resources. Review the beers list, which identifies drugs that might be problematic in elders. Contact the Alzheimer's Association. Many primary docs don't have extra training in treating dementia. Seek out one out of 3,500 practicing geriatricians or a geriatric department in medical school. The meds matter. Sue has lived alone for 20 years. She's thin with translucent skin, a shadow of the beautiful woman in the portraits on the wall. There are people trying to get into the house at night. These intruders, she say, move things and make life difficult for her. Sue has isolated herself. Beyond help with groceries, she refuses any care. Uh, sorry, I'm getting messages from my team. She refuses any care. She screams when anyone tries to clean up or organize the clutter in her home. I can take care of myself, but she can't. She's fallen several times, so her nephew, her only family, began looking into placing her in a facility. Sadly, while he planned, she fell and broke her neck. At the hospital, lashing out aggressively, she screamed in pain. She was old, frail, critically injured, and still psychotic. It took two people standing guard to keep her charging off the bed. The doctors immediately treated her aggression with the antipsychotic Haldol and the sedative Ativan, but because of hypersensitivity to the opioid crisis, they did not give morphine. It might sedate her. Her words were slurred and her chin and mouth were scrunched up in the hard neck brace. Her pain needed more effective treatment. The doctors feared that like meds, she might be over sedated. So instead they chose not to give her any scheduled morphine, not even very small doses several times a day. So Sue was essentially sedated with psych meds into a mix of silence and excruciating pain. Problem solved, right? Soon after she was placed in hospice in a sedated state. Thankfully, the hospice gave her narcotics to treat her pain. Her agitation subsided and her psych meds were decreased so she was no longer drowsy. She spent her last months more comfortably with her pain treated. The meds matter. So what if you're a healthy elder with no signs of dementia? Is your pain well treated? Well, not necessarily. Researchers found that among elders without dementia, almost half reported severe pain before and after hip surgery. The study found that 75% of non-demented patients did not get adequate pain relief or pain medications without asking for them. It's even worse for elders with dementia. They received just one third the amount of narcotic pain relief that normal elders received. This suggests that the majority of dementia patients, uh, excuse me, this suggests that the majority of dementia patients uh, suffer severe, untreated post-operative pain. I'm not saying that all uh, that we treat all pain with narcotics. Alternative pain treatments exist. Physical therapy, acupuncture, Tylenol, gabapentin can be used for more mild pain. Some common pain killers can cause problems for elders. Using Motrin or Naproxen long-term can lead to increased risk of heart attacks, strokes, kidney failure, or GI bleed. Tramadol can cause sedation and confusion. Caution is important with opiates. It's particularly important to use low dose and treat for constipation. But sometimes, narcotics such as Norco or methadone are the needed pain relief. If physical therapy and more mild medications fail, opiates might be indicated. Those with dementia are a vulnerable population. They cannot communicate their needs. They're not addicts manipulating their caregivers for more medication. They don't even know what meds they're on. Ethically, we doctors must do no harm. Sedating elders in pain is harm. Joe, a 60-year-old former physician's assistant, ended up in the hospital for two months. Why? Because no facility would accept him. His speech and behavior were bizarre from frontal dementia. 
music, engagement, and family visits didn't help. Joe was even more aggressive when visitors left. One person who tried to bathe him was seriously injured and put out on disability. The hospital officials posted a security guard, not a nurse's aide at his door. Essentially, Joe was on lockdown in a darkened room alone. His quality of life prospects were bleak. His wife looked for another alternative. A geriatrician was brought in for a second opinion. Over several weeks, Joe's mood stabilizer was actually doubled and another antipsychotic added before he stabilized. And yet in this case, more medication was actually part of the life-saving solution. You see, it's not the medications that are bad, it's the misuse of meds that is bad. Joe's aggression cooled, but he was not sedated. He was discharged to a dementia community, and after spending a week in his room, watch closely, he joined the greater community for four years, unrestrained and without incidents until his death. Because Joe's meds had been adjusted properly, this isn't a tragic story of suffering over those years. He was free to enjoy a supportive community, and in the end, although Joe couldn't speak, he could smile and pat others on the shoulder. But he was not strapped to a bed in a darkened room with a guard. The meds matter. His wife and family could visit, and they were tremendously grateful that he was no longer restrained, and he never had to return to the emergency room. As his dementia progressed, the psych meds were slowly tapered so he wasn't sedated. Eventually, he was placed on hospice and died peacefully. One thing about dementia that's not commonly recognized, those suffering from dementia often exhibit serious behavioral symptoms such as delusions or paranoia. Treat pain, taper down tranquilizers, check the med list for medications that are not recommended for elders, employ person-centered care, use antipsychotics if the elder is delusional, psychotic, or violent. While this checklist is not widely employed, it's exactly the advice of the American Psychiatric Association. In 2016, the expert panel reviewed all the studies of the treatment of agitation in people with dementia. Here's what they found. One, pain needs to be treated. Two, tranquilizers like Ativan and Xanax can increase confusion and aggression in elders with dementia. Stopping abruptly can cause more confusion and aggression. They must be tapered slowly. The medical team should review the uh, beer's list of drugs that may cause problems for elders. The list is long and includes allergy pills, particularly Benadryl, Tylenol PM, some ben uh, bladder pills, seizure pills or steroids, and anticholinergic drugs that block nerve cell communication. The expert panel further recommended that if an elder with dementia has delusions, psychosis, leading to severe distress or aggression that poses a risk to themselves or others, antipsychotic medications should be used. Antipsychotics do need to be used with great care. They may increase the risk of stroke by 2%, and rarely they cause sedation, confusion, or restlessness. But for patients, these medications offer the possibility of relief from distress, from paranoia, and offer the only opportunity to stay with loved ones and avoid the nursing home. This gift of care at home is a benefit that can be recognized at less emotional cost to the family and financial savings to families in our society at large. The meds matter. Don't drug grandma. Find the right approach to distress, to distress and agitation. Stop medications that are no longer useful. A yearly review with a doctor or provider focused on uh, geriatric medical needs or a geriatrician if possible. Look for and treat pain in elders. Youth are more likely to use narcotics for fun or to treat emotional pain. Remember, only 25% of non-demented elders received adequate pain treatment, and those with dementia received only one-third the amount of narcotics that non-demented patients received. We always look to engage elders, address their needs, reassure them, treat aggression with fun, music, and comfort. When that does not work, some needs anti depressants, mood stabilizers, or antipsychotics to treat difficult delusions or aggression. The focus must always be on the quality of life of the elder. The meds matter. Thank you, Vince. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you, Dr. Landsberg. Um, yeah, so there are a couple questions. I can't questions. quite hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Almost. Okay, so one practical call question uh, we have here is um, from oh. Teresa Mulvaney. Um, do you make house calls in the greater San Francisco area? 
yes, we do. Um, actually, let me. Modern technology. Um, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm. Oops. Where am I? Uh, I make house calls from San Francisco down to San Jose, and my partner, Dr. Danik, makes house calls in Sonoma, Marin, and the East Bay. Okay, so uh, you basically have the whole Bay Area covered. Uh -huh. yeah. um, so you referred to, I mean, you're bringing to light something that is very important, especially when it comes to geriatrics. Oh. Um, I remember in the mid 80s, uh, even onto the mid 90s, there was a push by general practitioners uh, to uh, for antibiotics. And it's come to light in the beginning of the 20, uh, 21st century that that may have hindered our, our society's uh, immunity or, or created the ability for superbugs. Is that, is the level of uh, oversubscription or, or push towards these uh, antipsychotics and, and, and painkillers is are we seeing something on par with that same push towards antibiotics and what is that what is the fallout if so okay so I, I was part of the California Coalition for Culture Change um, I got Medicare money to make several um, videos about when antipsychotics are appropriate and when they aren't. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, particularly in the 80s, uh, there was just wholesale use of particularly antipsychotics to just sedate elders and you'd go into a nursing home and everyone would be drugged. Well, that's not okay. That's why we have the over 87 saying that you cannot use uh, chemical restraint to um, restrain someone and that's appropriate. Um, I think that Antipsychotics should not be used for someone who says, I want to go home, I want to go home, I want to go home. And, and Vince, your team, you know, does a really great job of engaging people. So what happens as people go from normal functioning to their memory declines some to they might, you know, forget where things are and be paranoid of family or caregivers, you know, working with them, just keeping them engaged with things that they enjoy, like if they enjoy gardening, make sure that they spend more time gardening so they have less time to fester about, you know, what's going on. Uh, these medications should not be used for sleep. But at the same time, we find that if you use sleeping pills, even Ativan, but I see a lot of Ativan and Xanax used to try and help these people sleep, that that's going to uh, cause more problems uh, that the the person on Ativan, Xanax, Clonopin, at a certain point is going to withdraw from them. And then as they withdraw, then they become more agitated and then they get treated with more benzos. So the antipsychotics don't have that withdrawal part, but, you know, they became the go-to because they would just quiet people down and they would give them to them for sleep. Well, you don't want to have an increased uh, stroke risk to just get sleep. There's other things to do. Most importantly is treating pain. Um, and the other is keeping people active during the day. Um, antipsychotics should be the last resort. Mm -hmm. But if someone is delusional and paranoid, and and it's not only if they're aggressive toward any anyone else, yeah, people who are paranoid that their food is being poisoned so they won't eat, or that their husband's having an affair and they just you know perseverate on that all day and they're miserable, that's a reason to try and treat the delusions. Um, the narcotics. You know, so there is a horrible opioid crisis. And I saw one woman who said that she took her Norco just to help her sleep. Mm -hmm. And she was getting prescriptions for a large amount every month. And no, that's not okay either. But that I don't see very much. What I'm seeing, you know, there is an opioid crisis. And a lot of that is middle-aged and younger adults who are pretty much hopeless about the future. And they're using the narcotics just to feel better. Um, with elders, what I am seeing is what distresses me incredibly is such as someone's had a hip fracture and they, you know, basically treat with Tylenol as needed and maybe Tramadol as needed, trying to avoid the narcotics because they think the elders are going to get addicted. Mm -hmm. It happens just rarely. And actually caring for elders with dementia is much easier because they're not in charge of their medications, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can yeah. put more on and you put less on. So it's important to treat the pain. And, and you know, narcotics are not always the go-to. My favorite go-to is a long-acting Tylenol for breakfast and dinner for any agitated uh, elder with dementia. 
because they may not be able to recognize and understand what's going on with their body. So that's where I start. Okay. Good. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for touching upon that opioid crisis. And, and it, it definitely starts with the behavior management uh, to get to the idea oh, yeah. of whether or not um, pain is prevalent or if we're dealing with the side effect of the disease process. Um, so what is your team seeing you know, that, that's most helpful? in these situations? So definitely, it's one of those things where, yeah, we have to decipher whether this is a, uh, an agitated behavior. Uh, we strive to push person-centered uh, approach. Uh, so trying to get down to, is it an emotional issue? Are they riding a wave? Are these just trends in, in emotions or, or behaviors rather than an actual pain? Um, I know uh, from, from the past, you know, we've, we've seen you brought in to many situations where you were able to distill and, and, and um, alter courses of medication and care plans uh, to the benefit of the patient simply because um, you're you're able to ask the right questions that you know a specialist uh, would be expected. Uh, so families were definitely uh, happy that you were brought along and your consult was there. Um, I think another point, and this may be anecdotal, but it was very it was very um, poignant to me was um, I think when people of of age and the senior community uh, begin developing behaviors. Um, and also, uh, especially, uh, there's always a, an ageist sort of bent um, when people are deciphering what the baseline is for an elderly person, um, and, and sometimes even, even women. Uh, do you find that when people uh, describe to you what their loved one is going through, that there are societal norms that come into play when they're setting a baseline of what's agitated and 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 this person's acting out and, and voicing themselves versus what they're expected to be acted out or what's expected of someone of that of that generation. Well, you know what's what's really um, concerning to me is when an elder, particularly an elder who started a new medication, and I got to say Tylenol PM should be taken off the the shelves. Mm -hmm. But someone who had been functional, actually, I can think of one woman who had just been driving around wandering at night, and they took her to the hospital, they tied her down, and they gave her psych meds and Ativan, and she never got out after that. Well, you know, that would have been a perfect time to kind of figure out what was going on getting her home care, mm -hmm. you know, and, and getting her right back out of the hospital and not giving her too much medication. So I see that a lot where they present to the ER, you know, they're delirious or the meds are all screwed up and they're like, oh, bad dementia, you know, they just have to be placed or maybe we need hospice. So, yeah, I think there's definitely ageism out there and the expectation that whatever this doctor sees is the way they are all the time, not that there's been some crisis or some problem. And I hear a lot, you know, that they blame the urinary tract infection. And sometimes it's that. More often it's a new medication or a problem. Uh, an, another medical problem or a, you know, a situational problem where there's a new caregiver who just has a, a approach that, you know, the, the elder just really hates and is saying, you know, get the hell out of my house and is, is hitting when they get close. And that's misinterpreted, not that you need a caregiver who's better skilled, but that this person's really demented and they need, you know, they need to be medicated more. So that's what I see a lot. Okay. Yeah, I think there is always that that, that prehistory that needs to be understood. Um, um, we have another chat question um, from Didi Pianyan. Um, are you available and willing to give a free talk in skilled nursing facilities and assisted livings? Um, yeah. Uh, to add to that, I mean, given the fact of our current situation, how does that play out when you're 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 being requested for those things? Well, I'm doing a, um, a lot more online talks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what is interesting is there's a lot of a move to telemedicine, uh -huh. and there's a place for it. But I think particularly for elders, um, my partner and I have continued to do house calls through this whole, you know, um, virus uh, mm -hmm. pandemic, and we're careful, you know, just so everyone knows. The N95 mask protects you from 96% of, you know, the viruses, and the surgical mask is not really there to protect you, but to keep you from expelling droplets and infecting other people. So we always wear a mask. We have our hand sanitizer, 
Um, and we are very careful about what we do. But I think it's really important to see the elder, you know, stand them up, check the blood pressure, to do the exam. You know, sometimes I'll hear new so uh, sounds in the lungs that might be heart failure or something else that unless I did the exam, I wouldn't know. You know, I can take a close look at the rash. I can look at their function. And depending on what the facility tells you, one woman who I knew had horrible spinal pain and was in skilled nursing, um, the daughter, who's also a nurse, was told, oh, no, she's fine. She's all right. I go in there. She's in a horrible pain. She's got a horrible um, rash on her bottom because she's so angry and doesn't want them to turn her that she hasn't been turned. And so, you know, you, you have to get in there to see exactly what's going on. And, you know, just like home care, you're there and you know day in and day out, you can tell the doctors. I mean, you know, that's a little better because you can tell the doctors day in and day out what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm finding that the house calls are really important. And we are developing, uh, we have an online platform. Also, you know, Zoom is, is handy. We're also doing um, the TED Talks as webinars. We're going to just, uh, I'll do that for any group. That, that's kind of my public service. And um, I definitely want any feedback. I apologize that I don't have it memorized. It's really kind of hard to memorize 15 minutes of material. But I've also tried to kind of condense it down. And I, my, my big messages are we have to get rid of the wrong medications. We have to treat uh, the pain. And then we have to look at what psych meds might be helpful. But we do not use long-term Ativan and Xanax. In fact, you know, if anything, if someone has to have like a gallbladder procedure or something, we'll give a little bit of Ativan, but kind of nothing else. Uh, that just causes so much problems. So I guess my question to the audience is, did that communication come through, even though the style might not have been as polished as, as, um, as we'd like? I'm also on Facebook on Saturday at noon doing High Noon with Dr. Liz and Friends. And I have a 10 to 20 minute um, presentation I've done, you know, taking care of elders in the time of COVID, safer family gatherings in the time of COVID. I just did working safer in the time of COVID. And that's a huge debate. Uh, basically, you know, if we're going to open up, and I think that's not bad, but we all have to be careful, social distancing, you know, wearing masks. Um, and the piece that we're really missing is that we really need to have extensive testing particularly for um, elder care facilities, skilled nursing, hospitals. The hospitals are doing pretty good. They're testing everyone coming in. But now they're starting to look um, at the assisted living, and they're testing all the residents, all the staff. I got tested a couple weeks ago. I'm negative. Yay. Uh, so those are some of the things that we're doing. And we have a workshop coming up the last Tuesday of the month. It's a free workshop with Tammy Anastasia and Irene Dawkins, oh. my director of oh. education. Very nice. Um, that's also free. That's on, um, we're developing that platform. And that will be, you know, focusing more on, on how the caregiver can get through all this. Very nice. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, the, the website's here in the chat. Irene was very kind enough to, to share it, www.elderconsult.com. Um, so, yeah, there's a bevy of resources that you're offering to the community at large. Um, uh, we have another question here from Jane Doiser. Sure. Um, uh, my mother is 99 and is very much with it. She's in assisted living. After three months of lockdown, she is very frail and not moving on her own anymore. She has had trouble oh, sleeping so for a long time. Recently, she's yeah. been prescribed low-dose Ativan. It's helping some. Can you point me in the right direction to look at alternatives to help her sleep? Before I let you answer, I have to preface that yeah, any advice given during this is not to be construed as right. uh, a medical prescription. Uh, it is merely advice right. in a public forum. Um, if you want more information, you would have to definitely um, follow up with Dr. Um, Landsberg uh, at um, elderconsult.com. But uh, feel free uh, to, to go ahead and answer this. Right. And, and on our website, we have a place where people can put a question through for free at our community chat. Um, and there it's like you have to talk with your own doctor or lawyer, uh, but I'll give you good general information. So that's heartbreaking. And that's part of the reason that we keep doing house calls is, you know, you don't really know what's going on with someone unless you go in and see them. And the fact that, you know, if they're in lockdown and they have to stay in their room and they're sitting, you know, all day, Elders lose 5% of their muscle mass if they don't move, and you know regular adults, 5% of their muscle mass every day, and regular adults lose only 1%. So she might be at much higher risk for falls and fractures 
Um, you know, depending on where you are, I often like, um, so the, the beauty of assisted living is that you have more activities. Well, if you, and, and some places like Belmont Village, you know, they still have their circle of friends activities. They have the um, tables six feet apart and the residents wearing masks while they're doing drawing, and that's pretty cool. Um, but if they're not having the activities and they're stuck there, I worry that they don't have the supervision that they would if they were at home with one-on-one -on -one caregivers or at a small, well-run board and care. It's usually a board and care run by a nurse where two people are looking out for five people. And then on top of that, if you give them Ativan that makes them a little bit more confused or a little dizzy or gets their balance off, then they're more likely to fall and break a hip. Um, so for, you know, your mother, I guess the question I would have, and what I often see is that someone's sleeping during the day or they're giving them actual caffeine, you know, you got to get rid of the caffeine, you know, for, uh, more hardy folks and in independent living, you know, often I see they have the happy hour and they're having their alcohol <laughs> and then they're not sleeping and then they get the sleeping pill. Well, you know, that's not a good combination, but as I said, I do house calls from San Francisco down to San Jose and Dr. Danik does them from. Marin over the East Bay. Um, so that is definitely something we can help with. But the other thing is to think about, you know, does she need a higher level of care? And when I say that, you know, when in the hospital, the doctor thinks, well, if they can't be in assisted living, they have to be in the nursing home. And what I'm saying is you need a higher touch. Either you need a one-on-one -on -one, and um, Vince, I'm sure your team would come in to assisted living that allow it. So that would be one way to do it is to stay in that assisted living um, and have more care there. Another way would be to be at home with the one-on-one, -on -one, and the last is to be in a board and care room. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, there are a lot of services, and I, I have seen that when um, doctors or healthcare teams try to write off in terms of transition, they don't think of different levels of care within a facility. They automatically think it's more clinically intensive, and therefore that person should be there. Um, the catch to that is you lose certain aspects of socialization, uh, you lose certain activities and facets uh, as well. So, uh, yeah, thank you for pointing that part out as well. Um, are there any more questions uh, for Dr. Lazarick? Oh, so yes, uh, she's in Ohio. Ohio. Well, <laughs> you know what? So if you're in Ohio, what I would suggest is um, call the Alzheimer's Association. And then I would also look for... Um, a nice little board and care. Actually, what I've seen with board and care is if you can get a house where you have like five people taken care of by two people, a number of times there's going to be a way to bring the elder out to the patio and then you can see them, you know, you can stay five, ten feet away out in the yard. So that would be my recommendation in uh, uh, Ohio. And I would also ask for a physical therapy evaluation to see how she's doing. Very nice. And I've gone ahead and um, put the 24-hour the helpline for uh, Alzheimer's Association in the chat. So um, feel free to go ahead and uh, reach out to that. Um, um, it looks like that's uh, all the questions we have. Oh, there's one, we, actually, there's, one, there's more. one more. I'm sorry. Edgar, Mr. Edgar okay. Ayala, I apologize, Edgar. Um, my mother is 80 years old. Uh, she is in remission of lymphoma cancer one year and a half. Uh, she is a very introvert person, little by little, before I saw she has problems with her behavior. Right now, she is worse. Uh, she is taking some pills to control her irritation and frustration because she feels weak and useless. Hmm. Well, that's uh, heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. So given that scenario, um, someone brings this and presents this to you, what are the different factors here? We have a cancer patient, um, maybe naturally right. introverted. Um, declining behavior and uh, taking pills to control irritation and frustration uh, due to feeling right. weak and uselessness. Um, right. So I'd be worried about depression. You know, mm -hmm. if she's aware of herself, uh, it might be that an antidepressant is needed. You got to be careful because uh, a number of, and you can look on our website, www.elderconsult.com slash medications. There's a whole sheet of the most common psychoactive medications and the things that they're more uh, the most common side effects and the often the antidepressants such as Zoloft, Prozac, um, Lexapro, Citalopram or Celexa can decrease the appetite. So if she's feeling weak, you got to be a little careful, but there are things that if she is depressed uh, and she should get assessed for that. I mean, hopefully in your area, there's a geriatrician. Um, there are other treatments.
treatments for it. I'd want to know, you know, is her blood pressure too low? I think that's something that gets overlooked a lot when they feel weak is that um, if you it, sometimes, well, often an elder has their blood pressure take, taken uh, sitting down and it might be fine, 110 or something like that. You stand them up and their blood pressure can drop to like 90 or 80 and that can make them feel weak as well. You'd want to check her blood tests and see is her thyroid off? Is she having trouble with heart failure? You know, is she anemic? There's a number of diff different things that could be going on. So she needs a good medical evaluation and a good evaluation of her situation and function. Okay. That's what we geriatricians do. <laughs> okay. Um, good. Thank you from Edgar. Uh, yeah, feel free to go ahead and, and click on that as well. Um, I put the medication site from elderconsult.com uh, for anyone who's interested and wants to take a look. Oh, and then the last the last thing that we have is, so in the next day or two um, from the show, um, Saturdays at noon on Facebook, mm -hmm. if you click the link, elderconsult.com slash high noon tips, that's H-I-G-H-N-O-O-N-T-I-P-S. This week is the um, information uh, from the last show, which was tips about how to be safer at work when you go back to work. This Saturday, I'm giving a show on, or I'm presenting a show on stress and anxiety in the time of COVID and its resources and tips on what to do to, to you know, kind of get through this difficult time yourself. So hopefully everyone can join me and help me get the word out. I, I Vince, I very much appreciate, you know, this opportunity to share with your community. Yeah, um, we definitely like having you. Um, always a pleasure. Um, if uh, anyone else has any questions, I, again, I, I went ahead and linked um, high new tips over at elderconsult.com. So feel free to click on that Thank as you. well. Um, yep. Uh, any closing thoughts, Dr. Landsberg? You know, um, this is a difficult time, but I think that if we all do our part, you know, to wash hands, social distance, wear our masks, and just keep tabs on our elders. You know, keep an eye on them, see what support they need and be there for them. It's going to make it easier, you know, for them to get through. And I think there's a lot that we can share. You know, we can work in our own garden. You know, my um, my family is now into making bread. So it's a time to kind of go back and, and engage our elders. And, and there's still a lot of ways we can share with them, particularly if they're in our bubble. If they're not so much in our bubble, we can still think of ways to connect with them, um, that we can have a picnic at their place, you know, um, maybe having takeout and putting it in the middle and wearing masks to get food, but then sitting six feet apart. So you can still be connected, but we just have to do things a little bit more creatively. Um, and treating elders, we definitely have to take care of their pain. I mean, it's I I really wish that this geriatric protocol was employed everywhere because I often hear, oh, mom's just so nasty, she's never going to get better. And you take care of her pain and you get rid of, you know, the, the Ativan or the sleeping pills and treat whatever's left over. And they do quite well and they can get reengaged with their family and their community. So I, I hope everyone can reach out and be there for their family and, and also access the resources, whether they need caregivers at home or just some help in adjusting the medications. You know, it takes a village and we're all there for you. Thank you, Vince. Of course, thank you. And you know, um, everyone, I, I wanna thank uh, you all for taking the time today. Uh, Dr. Lonsberg, definitely thank you for taking the time uh, to educate us on, on, on agitation and then the current state of medication. Um, yep, as she said, it, it is really about checking in on people. So if anyone out there uh, needs uh, the services of of uh, our company, Care Indeed, to go in and check on your loved one uh, in a more personal one-to-one -one setting. Um, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we're at careindeed.com. Um, Dr. Landsberg, uh, thank you for taking the time out of the busy schedule. Um, I know as soon as we uh, depart from this, uh, you're gonna hit um, start and then be on your way again. So yep. always the road warrior. Um, I definitely yep. uh, hope you uh, are being safe and, and, and taking care um, and uh, thank you again. Oh, thank you. This is fun. Have a good day. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, again, my name is Vince Amazona. Thank you for taking part in today's uh, lecture. Uh, Dr. Landsberg, elderconsult.com. Um, be safe, everyone, and hope you have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.